Hi everybody, this is God Sad for the Sad Truth. In my 2007 book, The Evolutionary Basis of Consumption, in the last chapter of that book, I discuss the myriad of benefits that uh, accrue uh, in Darwinizing consumer research. And one of the most important ones of the list of benefits is the fact that evolutionary psychology serves as a meta framework by which one can organize otherwise phenomena that seem to be uh, disparate all over the place. And so in the same way that in biology, the theory of evolution is the framework that unites knowledge across different units of analysis, whether it be at the cellular, molecular, organismic, population level, species level, at the ecological level, uh, evolution permeates throughout any unit of analysis, right? There aren't biologists who believe in evolution and professional biologists who uh, don't believe in evolution. And so uh, biology is uh, internally coherent or as coherent that one can, can hope to have a, you know, an unfolding science precisely because it has a meta framework uh, from which it can operate to create core knowledge and then spread out uh, in creating new boundaries for that core knowledge. Of course, I argue that the behavioral sciences in general and consumer research in particular are typically uh, disjointed, incoherent, disorganized, uh, not because uh, sociologists and consumer psychologists are any dumber than uh, biologists, but it's because they don't have a fundamental meta framework that allows one to organize knowledge into a coherent tree of knowledge, which is something that I covered in my uh, forthcoming journal marketing research uh, paper. And so in, in several of the venues where I've uh, authored uh, my works, I've discussed about these benefits that accrue to uh, any discipline that incorporates evolutionary thinking within its uh, toolbox. And so today I wanted to specifically talk about consilience. Uh, and I'd like to quote uh, uh, an absolutely wonderful set of passages that actually comes from a paper that, uh, in my view, has not received the attention that it deserves, perhaps because it is published in a outlet that is not, you know, one of the more prestigious outlets. Uh, but anyways, just to sort of step back, some of you may have, uh, either if you've read my work or listened to some of my uh, lectures, uh, I often refer to consilience as a uh, fundamental benefit that, as I said, accrues to uh, disciplines that incorporate ev the evolutionary lens within their, uh, you know, as, as, as their meta framework. But what is consilience? So consilience is a term that uh, was, if you like, repopularized in the uh, collective uh, vernacular, in the collective lexicon by E.O. Wilson. He, he wrote a book in the late 90s called uh, Consilience, uh, Unity of Knowledge. But Well, consilience exactly means that, unity of knowledge. So, uh, you know, physics is more consilient than sociology. Uh, biology is more consilient than, uh, you know, women's studies. Uh, and again, this is not to speak to, you know, the intelligence or the scientific credentials of one field versus another. It rather speaks about an epistemological truth, whether the knowledge that is generated is generated via a coherent meta framework or not. And so what I'd like to do next is read to you a quote that I have on a few occasions read in lectures and, and in various uh, other contexts. Uh, and I thought that, you know, I would uh, re-mention it here as part of a sad truth clip. So this comes from a paper by November, that's the name of the, the last name of the author, November 2004 on page 42. And I will put a link to the actual uh, paper uh, if anybody wants to follow up and read the paper in question. So this, this is going to speak exactly about this notion of consilience or lack thereof. Uh, this particular author is talking about the lack of consilience in marketing, uh, which of course, as you probably know, I am a professor of marketing. Uh, 
but of course it applies to pretty much much of the social sciences. And it is precisely what I seek to uh, address by infusing evolutionary biology and evolutionary psychology within consumer behavior and marketing. So here we go. So this is the quote by November. Some academics talk about gaps in the literature as though the literature is, w is a well-built wall with just the occasional gap that needs filling. Each study is, as Pink Floyd would say, another brick in the wall. The reality is that while we do seem to have an agreed standard as to what a brick is, there is no agreement as to which bricks need to be made first, no foundations, no architect of the final wall, and no idea as to what the wall is expected to do when, if ever, it is built. It is as though we are constructing the Great Wall of China by agreeing that all of the bricks will be empirical studies that pass certain statistical tests. However, we do not agree on who will build each bit of the wall, nor do we agree on when or where we will build it. The consequence is that we have hundreds of well-meaning marketing scholars working very hard at making bricks. Each journal and each conference is just a jumble of bricks with the occasional group cemented together by a short-term research fad, fashion, or multi-researcher project. I mean, this guy could not be any more spot on. Let me continue with the quote. In strong disciplines, there is a natural organizing framework built into the knowledge itself. <clears throat> Excuse me. In chemistry, there's the periodic table, as well as subdivisions into inorganic, organic, physical, etc. In mathematics, there is algebra, arithmetic, arithmetic, geometry, statistics, etc. In structural linguistics, there is phonology, morphology, syntax, and semantics. In geology, there are eons, eras, periods, and epochs. In music and art, there are the major historical periods. We have no agreed fundamental structure around which we build knowledge, only a ragbag system of textbook chapter headings. Its absence means that practitioners, with their narrow self-centered perspective on knowledge, are bewildered. What is truly remarkable is that marketing academics seem to thrive with a flimsy rather than a well-grounded structure of knowledge. This is a very, very powerful quote. Now, I may disagree with him about the extent to which uh, linguistics and, uh, and art, uh, you know, have organizing uh, headings, if you'd like. Uh, but the general point is quite clear. Uh, you know, in chemistry, you don't have, as I've often uh, quipped, you don't have folks who are for the periodic table and folks who are against the periodic table. But now imagine what I recently had to endure in my testimony regarding Bill C-16. Well, I had to appear in front of Parliament, in front of the Canadian Senate, to actually argue that sex differences exist that humans come in two phenotypic forms called male and female, that they are a sexually dimorphic species, that they, that they are innate sex differences that are part of the evolutionary history of our species. The fact that I actually have to make that point suggests how outlandishly non-conciliant the social sciences are, right? The fact that I have to actually uh, demonstrate that this is a starting point on which any clear thinking person should agree uh, on, the, on those particular points uh, demonstrates the problem with the social sciences. So it's not that the social sciences are any less, I mean, epistemologically speaking, any less scientific than physics, right? A, a scientist is anyone who adheres to the scientific method in the pursuit of truth. So you could be a very serious scientist who happens to be a sociologist, just like you could be a very serious physicist. It's not the fact that you wear a lab coat or whether you have a Bunsen burner in, in the background that makes you a scientist or not. It's not whether you, you can uh, you know, uh, utter uh, chemical compounds that are difficult for most people to pronounce that makes you a scientist, but whereas if you study psychology, somehow you are a lesser scientist. Absolutely not. As a matter of fact, some of the most profound scientific uh, 
phenomena that we've uncovered have come from the behavioral sciences because they say something very profound about human nature. So what makes you a scientist or not is whether you adhere to the scientific method or not. Now, of course, many of the social sciences that are that have been parasitized by activism are even that much more of sciences because what drives them is not the pursuit of truth, but rather uh, adherence to an ideology, right? So you propagandize, you uh, inculcate ideology rather than pursue truth. Uh, so anyways, all this to say that, uh, you know, it, it has been my life's work as a, an academic to convince my colleagues, at least in the social sciences, that there is no way that you could study uh, consumer behavior uh, or any other uh, phenomenon involving humans uh, without ever realizing that the minds of humans uh, didn't mysteriously arise out of nothing, but they come from uh, very specific evolutionary forces. And once you recognize that, then you're able to uh, erect an edifice of scientific knowledge that is consistent, that is coherent, that is not disjointed, and that allows you to then have consilience. So there you have it, folks. Uh, what is one of the most fundamental problems in the social sciences is the lack of consilience, and I hope that through my work and the work of uh, other evolutionary-minded scholars, we can slowly seek to fix that. Hope you have a great weekend. Talk to you soon. Ciao.